I'm here to just hang out on stage and tell you guys a little bit about storytelling in Path of Exile. Oops. So first off, I want to answer the question, who am I? So a year ago, I was hired, brought over from the States to help work on 4.0. And obviously, it's been secret this whole time. So I haven't been able to talk about this at all with anyone, including my closest friends. Now I finally get to tell you guys all about how excited I am for this. Um, so the number one question here, when uh, I'm talking about like, what exactly I do. This is, I want to talk to two people. I want to talk to people who ask, why is the game the way that it is in terms of how it tells a story? Because there's a lot of stuff in the game that isn't just directly told to you. The second question is, I get uh, literally emails from people asking, how do I write a story for a game? Like people who want to get into the industry or people at other games, you know, they're, they're interested, like how do I make a story like this? And I always start with the question, what type of story is Path of Exile? And the answer is kind of insane. It's not a book or a movie. Uh, it's closest to a combination of choose-your-own-adventure, uh, a torn-up history textbook, and an encyclopedia. I was asked the question, how do we make that interesting? Well, I mean, we came up with a little process here. We got three major steps for this. I'm going to run through here real quick. We consider our audience because we have players. We don't really have readers. Like, someone who reads a novel will not experience the game the same way. And we want to try to build a narrative structure to contain the elements for that audience. And then finally, we want to try to attempt to implement it, which is an entirely different beast altogether. <laughs> Get into some hilarious examples of that. So when we consider the audience, we've come up at PATH with two axes that we like to consider. First is the playtime axis, in terms of how long people have actually played the game. And the second is the personality axis of what type of people are actually interested or not interested in the story. And then some interesting things happen when we combine those axes. But the first axis, the playtime axis, ranges from newbie to veteran. And it's not a quantifiable metric. We can't say one person with 10 hours played is the same type of person as another with 10 hours played. We can't even say for certain that someone who's played 1,000 hours is even a veteran. We, have, we can't assume anything. What this actually represents is an attitude towards knowledge and experience. So newbies are most evinced by the phrase, I have no idea what's going on. That's the number one thing that we, exactly, yeah. So newbies are in a word, they're overwhelmed. Everyone starts out a newbie, they're thrust into this world they've never heard of with gameplay they don't understand. Every single thing they encounter is new, but they have limited attention energy. The key to reaching these players is careful control of information flow. Here's an, I, this is my favorite example, like we're starting out with my favorite. What, this is the starting screen of 4.0, and if you guys play the 4.0 demo at all today, you have seen this. What do you see on this screen? You see absolutely nothing. It's gray, it's empty. I might even call it boring. I don't want to offend the art guys who made this, but it's on purpose. There's a bright gold arrow pointing at an item because we've taken out everything else that might overwhelm a newbie. There is literally nothing to look at on this screen except this bright gold arrow. And we also, because I said we can't assume anything, we literally mean that. We have to start with tutorials of every single type to reach these people. And this is crucial to the story because if players don't understand how to play the game, they're not going to be able to absorb the story either. And there are actually dozens of tutorials most players never see. In this example, this player hasn't moved for 30 seconds, so the game brightly figures maybe this person's never played a game before at all. So the first tutorial that most people don't see is it actually tells you that you have the ability to move. Left click to move. That's something most of us will never see because you assume that you can move in a game. It's crazy, except we have to cover these missing pieces of information because we can't assume anything. And we well, might have a newbie log in, not realize he can move, and then after five minutes of nothing happening, he quits and calls our game horrible, you know, on a, on a one-star review. We can't have that happening. <laughs> and so, like, uh, we can actually do some crazy stuff with these tutorials, especially in the opening area. So right here we have a shot. This is actually frozen, the way that the shaper in the original game freezes time, because this player has never used a flask throughout the entire area, and now they're, they're at low life. So we have actually stopped the game completely, and we say, you don't actually get to do anything else until you press one to use a flask. Because <laughs> if, again, if players play, um, play through the game without realizing that flasks exist or how they work, 
they're going to think the game is insanely hard, and they're going to quit, and they're going to give us one-star reviews. And finally, like, you can't even enter the town in 4.0 until you spend the skill point you get from reaching level 2, because imagine playing Path of Exile without realizing the skill tree exists. Like, you get to you know, five acts in, or five areas in, all of a sudden everything's impossible. So we've got to make sure that newbies actually understand what's happening before they can get to the story. But then, once it's time to get to the story, we're doing something here. This is actually the first village in the game of 4.0. So like, we've moved an NPC here. This is not his normal spot. We have this custom animation. After you talk to him, he'll walk to where he normally goes. But here, we have isolated this character, Renly, so that there is nothing else that you can possibly interact with until you talk to this guy. And if you want to run past him, that's your own fault. That's not my fault, <laughs> you know, if you skip that. But he's very clearly talked to this guy first, and he, Renly will actually tell you in his own words, in a long, drawn-out dialogue with nothing else to distract your attention, exactly what he feels is going on in his, you know, his encampment here. And it's important, like, actually the fact that this is not an objective narrator speaks to something I'll get to later. But there's no other characters, and there's no bright colors, there's no fancy doodads. The important thing is that these newbies know exactly what to look at to figure out what's going on at the start of the story, because this is the first thing that they're going to hear, and they really, really need to hear this, or they're not going to understand anything else that goes on later. We've also got numerous dialogue options that these newbies can have, and the way that we do it, we've always done it, in fact, in the old game as well, is that none of these options are available until you touch upon what they're relevant to. So, for example, here, Una has some options to ask about Finn or Renly. You can't ask her those questions unless you've met those NPCs, because what we're trying to do here is teach a new player, if you have a question, try to go talk to an NPC, because you just touched something, you're like, what the heck is that, or who is that guy? How should I feel about this? go talk to everyone else, now they have something to say about it. And if all of these options, there's like 15 more dialogue options that unlock by the end of Act 1. If all of those options were available immediately, the newbie would be completely overwhelmed, have no idea what's going on, and be very frustrated. And for another example here, there's a proclamation in the bottom right corner. You can actually ask Renly about the count who wrote that proclamation once you read that. So anything that might prompt a question, we actually have an NPC try to answer that for you. And the next thing that's really important is quest tracking. Because I said that we can't assume anything, and that goes very deep. So we can't even assume that the player knows what they own, their, their own character just did. So like maybe they didn't play for a while, maybe they weren't listening, maybe they just want to speed run this thing and skip by everything. The quest tracker succinctly lists exactly what the player needs, needs to do next. Like, this is for those people who have questions that the NPCs don't answer, or this is for people who haven't, you know, they put it down, they come back the next day, they're like, where was I? Well, the quest tracker will get them on track. And here you can actually see our new upgraded, up, our new up, our new upgraded quest UI, it's hard to say there, uh, with interesting pictures and stuff like that to characterize the act more than in the simple map that we had before. So what we're trying to do here is give players a feel of where they are in a living world. And the quest dates also have to match the player's experience so they can get quite complex. An example of that is Brutus. So many people assume that the Brutus quest is very simple because their experience with it is they run into the prison, they kill Brutus, and they move on. And that's it. They don't really get any other experience with that, except this has a ton of quest states that people don't realize exist. For example, we have quest states for where you got the quest. For example, you could get the quest from Tarkley first, or you could visit the prison before talking to anyone. You can take an early reward from Nessa or not take it. Have you actually seen Brutus? Have you killed Brutus? Have you gone on to Prisoner's Gate? Have you gotten the skill book and have you used it? Those all like, multiply each other into multiple quest states. And so in a, in a 4.0 quest with the hooded one here that uh, some of you people might have seen in the demo if you played it, you can actually skip the hooded one entirely and just go grab the runes that free him from the Tree of Souls. And, and let me tell you, that's already 23 quest states just to release this guy from this tree. Uh, because we, knew, we know that players are going to run past this guy, or talk to this guy, or do any combination of stuff in between. And uh, it gets out of hand really quickly. But that's really crucial to keeping players on track. They have the question, like, what am I supposed to do next is the biggest question in an ARPG. You always got to have the answer floating there right on the side of the screen. And now, so the, on the opposite end of this continuum, veterans. You see up there, they say things like, you know, I'm finally starting to get it. You know, I've done Uber Elder 150 times. Like, I think I'm getting a handle on the story. And as the writer, I like that. I appreciate that. You know, like, I hear you. Veterans have played the game. They know all the mechanics. They've played all the acts and they've mapped. 
but in contrast to newbies who are overwhelmed with information, veterans are information starved. They're actually so information starved that they're finally starting to pay attention to the game. <laughs> and you know, they're actually picking up on pieces of the story. So we give them more complex pieces of information to digest over time. One of the things that veterans see more than anybody else is boss details. So m regular monsters explode on site for veterans. They don't really see anything about that by the time that they're level 95 plus. So their biggest contact points for the story are bosses, especially ones with invincibility phases, and we all know about that. So the questions are like, why are we fighting a boss? Who is the boss? Where is their arena? What does it contain? I still hold that the Dominus fight in Act 3 still has like the coolest, most intensely detailed <laughs> arena of all of the uh, arenas in the game. That's like my personal favorite because there's just so much going on there. Every time I fight Dominus, I see a little bit more of this person's like attempt to gain power in this world of Ray class. I really love that. Another way we try to speak to veterans is flavor text. So veterans see uncommon things, all the stuff in the game, like uniques that newbies never run across. Veterans are aware of this stuff, they're using this stuff. And I love uniques that have flavor text that might not mean much initially, like Ezemite Peak. The flavor text of this, centuries of servitude, a day of glory, an eternity of death. What does that mean for, you know, actually, they might not even realize that Ezemite Peak refers to an actual culture which we are visiting in Act 1, 4.0. So we actually get to meet the Ezemites and understand from meeting these characters and learning about their history what that flavor text means to them. And if a veteran has seen this flavor text, they'll start to piece things together. And that's the, that's the feeling we're looking for. And that same flavor text grittiness also applies to keystones on the passive tree, which a lot of people don't realize actually have flavor text. They just allocate that node and they're done with it. But uh, I had a lot of fun with the timeless jewels, naming them and giving like, their, their flavor text and what the names of the keystones were. For example, the timeless jewel that, gives, that has uh, based on Venarius in, his, in its name and its, uh, in its mod text actually gives a keystone called the agnostic, whose flavor text is put your faith in intellect rather than mysticism. And on its own, that's like, oh, okay, fairly standard uh, fantasy type words, except it's about a character that was the primary leader of a religious organization. So if that's the case, that paradox is in place, what does it say about the character of Inarius? That's a question I like to leave there hanging, especially if, for people who played Synthesis. We did a real deep dive on his personality and his history. And finally, the best way to reach veterans is with memes. All the cool stuff that bosses say, you know, you got the pieties, enough of this, you can hear it, you know, the touch of God and uh, Malachi is, why are you so in love with death? Like, that's the stuff that we do that when a veteran, like, hears that over and over and is repeating that and they're joking about it, they're actually also absorbing part of the story. Like, when the Dominus says the touch of God, you know that his character is religious, you know, he's probably egotistical, uh, you know, like, he's a very villainous, over-the-top, like, righteous character, and that's all absorbed through a simple phrase. The other, per the other axis that we like to work with is lore scholar versus speedster. This is more specific to RPGs, but not necessarily exclusive to them. Because, again, this isn't quantifiable. Players may be feeling more like a lore scholar or more like a speedster on any given day. Like, for example, myself, I like to speedster through like, the early levels. When I'm like level 90, then I'll start worrying about the story. What this represents is an interest in story versus mechanics. Generally, lore scholars are hungry for every piece of the story. They may not even like the game's mechanics. Whereas a speedster, they love the game's mechanics and they're interested in story only as long as it doesn't get in the way. Which is why the speedsters say, this game has a story. And I make sure to downvote this every time I see this on Reddit. I'm oh, just kidding. But uh, speedsters, they're blazing through every area as fast as possible. They don't really like, want to focus on the story. They don't mind if it doesn't get in the way. They're min-maxing and they're thinking in terms of exalts per hour. It's like, how do we reach a person who really, really doesn't want to be reached? Well, first we start with mechanics, because that's what they're interested in. For example, the most common thing that speedsters know is that some guys used skill gems in the past and it destroyed them. And the reason that speedsters know this is because they're using skill gems themselves. And so they actually like, see these things, they drop, they use them. And that actually makes them pay attention to the little bits of skill gem lore that we do have in the game. So like, they're absorbing pieces of the story even if they don't want to. And the other way we talk to them is through loot. Stuff like the Marraketh weapons. Like, there's a whole series of Marraketh weapons, and I find this really interesting because this tells speedsters something about the Marraketh culture through art design and stats alone. 
that's a separate culture, first off, because it's a separate set of weapons. But second, what kind of look they might have, you know, what kind of people are they? And these weapons look a lot more brutal than a normal weapon, so we can assume they're like a warrior culture. And speedsters I th actually get some of that just by looking at the loot, especially when it comes to uniques. Like, there is no way that a speedster is going to miss the character and personality of Kalm, because Kalm's items are all over the place and they're fantastic for many reasons. They're very powerful if in the instance of Kalm's heart, or maybe racers want Kalm's primacy early, that kind of thing. We make sure that these items are useful because they're conveying a really important personality from the game. You've got to know who Kalm is. Like, that's just you know, one of the core personalities we've always had. And this is how we reach speedsters, is through these interesting, unique items. And we've actually went so far as having a strong box that can only drop Kalm items to make sure that they notice. And the other way we reach speedsters, uh, similar to memes, is the voice lines that they hear over and over. These don't necessarily have to be mimetic to reach speedsters because speedsters see voice lines more than anyone. Their combat dialogue, their hellos, their goodbyes, this applies to bosses, masters, town NPCs the most. Speedsters see them all the time, so we have to carefully craft these lines to not annoy them, such as Cassie is singing, which we both hated and loved. We've got to show something about the, the, the master and the boss and the world with these lines. This is a primary storytelling method for Nico's madness, for example. His increasing instability is almost seen exclusively in his hellos and goodbyes. And that's something that nobody could miss. As long as they're going back to Nico over and over, they're like, this guy's going crazy. And that's exclusively in like, hellos and goodbyes that like, can't be skipped. And they're very quick and they're very short, so speedsters don't get angry about it. <laughs> and as an example, the touch of God pulls du double duty here for both veterans and speedsters because Speedsters see this all the time, it's conveying a personality, and they can't miss it. But on the other end, lore scholars, of which I am one myself, they say things like, actually the rise of Chittis occurred on the first castle of Verusi in 1319 IC. What does that mean? Most people have no idea. But I love that somebody knows this and that somebody's correcting somebody else when I read this. So we're voracious. We wish to consume and understand all pieces of lore in the game to understand completely what is happening. We love making and reading theories. We love correcting people. You know? <laughs> and uh, it's just the lore that's in there, that's like the, the best thing we live for. Like we're playing to see what was this world about. So we're looking, we're looking for glyphs. For example, I've got a proclamation glyph here that's in the Act 1 town. And some people might read this glyph. All it says is able-bodied men with excavation skills must present themselves at the manor. And to a lot of people, that doesn't mean much. But to us, we're thinking, why does the manor need excavation skills? And we know the tropes. That, are they digging something evil up? Uh, yes, they, de they definitely are. So these glyphs, they provide deeper details into the story at large, and they help us, the lore scholars, think ahead. Because we like the mechanics, as long as they don't get way to the story, because we're the opposite of speedsters. But what we make sure to do with these glyphs is they are always subjective, and they're always left behind by specific personalities, so that you know that they're subjective. We don't have any sort of objective voice just telling you what the story is, because that would override any ability to think for yourself. And I think that lore scholars would be happy for an endless number of these glyphs, and they literally act as rewards for this type of player. For example, in 4.0, we actually have lots of little hidden rooms, actually. Like, this is sort of a new feature where, like, you can open a door and find a hidden room that's not always there, and in that room will be some treasure, but also a glyph that, like, I'm writing to fellow lore scholars, but, like, here you go, here's a reward just for you. And I'll write as many as the players want, because I love that kind of thing. <laughs> the other thing that, to reach lore scholars, though, we must be absolutely consistent. Narrative caretaking is key. And here's a great example that I like. Izaro the Mad Emperor has a detailed backstory as told by texts from the Parandis fam family, the Labyrinth, and even uh, this playbook that we're working on is like a choose your own adventure story. Um, but the key to the tale of Chittis Parandis and the Labyrinth is the Eternal's relationship with the Ezemites, and one Ezemite in particular who works with Chittis in the Labyrinth. And all that stuff is in Izaro's backstory and Chittis' backstory. But I always wondered, how do the Ezemites feel about Izaro? Well, in 4.0, we get a small window on this. If we recover Una's loot, she'll be able to play a song, and one of her songs is called Grand Folly. And she actually plays a uh, Ezemite version of the Labyrinth's area music and has a little quip about how, uh, oh yeah, it was right there, not a tale the Eternals would tell, because the Ezemites think Izaro is goofy and ridiculous, and they hate the Eternals. So I just love seeing the same story from a different perspective. Oh, crucial, crucial to lore scholars as well, which you wouldn't expect actually out of game stuff. Lore scholars are aware of every single piece of information we've ever put out on any medium, including talks like this one. 
So they're, they're probably going to watch this online, pay attention to things I say for little clues, and I have to make sure that I don't give away any spoilers, because we're watching. We hunt these lore bits down, we capture them into PDFs, so we, uh, so we have to make sure that every single lore piece fits in the world in an interesting manner. It's a giant puzzle, they're having fun putting it together, and if there's a conflict, they will find it and they will post about it endlessly. And if they post about it, somebody will be coming up to me at work and mentioning it, and I will have to fix that. So I make sure that that doesn't happen. Like, it's the most fun thing in the world to make sure that the narrative is completely consistent, even with out-of-game posts. And because lore scholars are aware of everything we ever say, sometimes there are oops. For example, not too long ago, somebody very important said in a Q&A that Calandra is a she. And the lore scholars did not miss that. I would say this is an oops, because how true is that? The writing staff may know, may know what Calandra is, but we kept details sparse on purpose. Like, I can't confirm anything about this, but this is an example where we, a single word can give away, like, oh my god, what did that mean? We have to be very careful of that. When you combine these two axes, you get this interesting cross-section. It looks like there's only four types of players, but there are actually many more types of player because the middle area counts too. For those that are balanced between the extremes, someone in the middle, they're not a speedster. They're not just racing through. But they're also not a lore scholar. They're not playing with and to find every single glyph in the game. So we've got a, a whole bevy here. We actually end up with like nine different player archetypes we have to worry about. Like a newbie lore scholar. Right out of the gate, we're giving this person letters of exile in like act one, in the original game. Like, so there's a glyph for you to read, frames what you're doing. But if you're a newbie middle person who's not a lore scholar, you're not gonna read those letters of exile, you're waking up on the beach, that's your story. You know, at least we're, we're taking it from there. But the newbie speedster, we give them skill gem choices in Lion Eyes Watch because they need mechanics immediately and they need to feel like they're making choices, interacting with mechanics, asking what these skill gem things are. The middle lore scholar, that's when they're like getting partially through the game, I love Sarn. Like, Sarn has so much story to it. We let the story grow in scope here while being supported by lore pieces. But middle, middle players who are halfway through the game and they're not really a lore scholar or speedster, they're not really paying attention to what Sarn is, but they are paying attention to good voice acting, good art, and focused storyline. So we have to bring some real emotion to what's happening with, like, Piety and Dominus, for example. There is no way that you have missed Piety and Dominus by Act 3. So we really capitalize on that for the real middle-of-the-road players, which is most people. Of course, the middle speedster, we have to speak to them through mechanics. So corruption, Val orbs, like the art of what corruption looks like, the beast in Act 4. You definitely can't miss the beast, and if you somehow miss the beast, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's massive, and it's insane, and I love it. But uh, that's something speedsters will absolutely see, no matter how much they try to avoid the story. And finally, as people get towards the end of the game, for lore scholars, we've got real deep, expansive arrays of backstory pieces like Victario, Chittis, Cesaro, like this whole story that's in there about what happened in the past. And most people aren't even aware of this. The Eternals, the Val, everything before that. Most people don't see that at all, but lore scholars, they're loving this stuff. Whereas the veteran average player, they're fighting Kitava, they're fighting the Shaper. We're bringing them payoffs to what's happened before. Like, so they encounter these bosses. They know that the storyline is about these bosses, and that's what they generally see. But veteran speedsters, they're about the maps, they're about Shaper and Elder influence, and that's an interesting choice that we made there. The influence mechanic is tied to the characters of the Shaper and the Elder and gives maps features of those bosses so that speedsters still absorb some of what they're seeing. Now that we've like, considered the audience of these types of players, um, we have to like, build a narrative structure to try to speak to these people. And what I like to do here, start with chaotic storytelling. I'll give you a couple philosophies that'll follow this shortly. But a player is an entity of pure chaos. That's rule number one. There is no way to predict what a player will do. In fact, across the population, they will do everything possible. Players group up. Quest states provide a framework, but only barely. Can they, you can't guarantee a sequence that a players will do things in. You can't guarantee they'll remember previous pieces. And you can't even guarantee that players will even hear audio or read dialogue. They could be distracted to catch jumps on the keyboard, or just, you know, killing bosses in one hit. So we have to lay out the world in an equally chaotic way. Assume nothing. Make sure every story glyph is its own piece and doesn't require knowledge of others. And this really speaks to the question at the beginning of like, how do we make like a torn up history textbook and an encyclopedia interesting? Well, we have to make our story fit into that insane framework because we can't assume anything about what players are doing because they're absolutely unpredictable. And in that vein, we, ha we build a fractured historical narrative because every single piece has to stand on its own, has to be about something. I've got a long quote on here, but the first tenet here is that, again, subjective. 
Siosa is giving us a quote about Malachi. Siosa doesn't necessarily know the full story. He has a few guesses. But beyond Siosa's, Siosa's opinion, who was Malachi? Who was Vol or Chittis? You'll have to find out more about those on your own from other sources and piece it together yourself. And another example of conflict here, Victario has an opinion on the gemlings that helped the Eternal Empire fall, but Kadiro, Chittis Parandis' uh, uncle, I believe, actually has a completely different opinion because these are two people with two very different agendas who lived at the time and had their own subjective opinions about what happened. So uh, to explain what happened here, the Emperor Chittis Parandis tried to make widespread use of implanted virtue gems to lift humanity to a new state of immortality and power. And that didn't go over well with the common people, so the, po the poet Victario tried to rouse the people against these gemlings, considering them abominations, but Chittis' family member had very different feelings and actually supported it because he was going to become very wealthy based on that power. And the question of who was right, it's not answerable. You know, we didn't live back then, and we only have their subjective voices. The other tenet here that we like to have is never over-explain. I like to leave open-ended questions supported by vague hints to stimulate player creativity. We never give them the answer to big questions because that would end the debate and stop the imagination. People ask questions like, what exactly happened to the Val? What is the Atlas? What is the Elder? What's up with it that fled? What the heck is wrong with Rayclast in general? You'll have to figure that out for yourself. But at the same time, we always give clear motivations. Uh, the player, the character themselves, needs to make sense. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? And it can be as simple as helping starving people get food or open the way inland, or you meet piety. I want to end piety's horrible experiments. So we try to line the character and the player motivations together. Bring down Dominus, stop Malachi, stand up to Kitava. These are very clear motivations. Never get confused about what you're doing because that's uh, crucial to player understanding the rest of the world is they have to understand their place in it. As I said, no objective viewpoint. There's no narrator. There's no game description with spoilers. There's no like paragraph on Steam that's saying like the secret of Ray class. No, nothing like that. And there's no, no writers like me stating in talks that the real answer is blank. You know, I can't do that. And for example of no objective viewpoint, I loved writing Venarius for the Synthesis League and it did have some of its uh, mechanical launch issues, but I still love the story of Synthesis. We go through a bunch of memories with Kavis before he knows that he's Venarius because this is a man who has lost his memories. He's wandering around Ray class. He doesn't know who he is. He asks the player to help him sift through floating memories to try to recover his life. Eventually, he remembers that he is Venarius, the High Templar who freed the Elder and doomed Xana's father to become the Shaper. Absolute villain as far as we're concerned because we already like Xana. But was he a good person or a bad person? The, like, the memories that we see, we can't even be sure are his, but some of them show a child growing up in a brutal society with a high, like the Templar organization was absolute crushing force. And they did all sorts of terrible things to Venarius, which seem to have prompted him to become very ambitious and a bid to just feel safe. And he often has lines about worrying about the safety of the children. And is he speaking about himself? It's hard to say because these memories are unreliable. And later, we actually, we actually bring in an unre two narrators, a second narrator. Xana, the one most hurt by Venarius, will narrate the same memories of Venarius narrated earlier to give you a different perspective on the same events and what she thinks Venarius might have been thinking. And ultimately, with his new memory control powers, Venarius planned to unite Rayclast under a single banner, believing it was the only hope against what he described as demons that surround the world. Uh, he was given knowledge as High Templar that most don't know about. We can only assume that maybe he was referring to Breach or Beyond Monsters and that kind of thing. However, are his motivations pure? Or is he potentially right? Does Rayclass need to unite to survive a dark universe filled with horrible monsters from every direction because you know, every three months we see some horrible new thing coming to kill us? Well, he, we probably side with Xana because Venarius was such a ruinous force in her life, but the truth is that this is a story rife with unreliable memories, multiple viewpoints, and Venarius not being true to his own belief, or true to himself because he's lying to himself in a lot of these memories, and we don't know how because he has the ability to edit memories, so we'll never know the true story of why he is the way that he is. But at the same time, this philosophy also applies to heroes and people that we work with. So for example, Jun, there's no easy answer or single objective viewpoint with Jun because we have questions about her. She tortures and murders to achieve her goals. We're very clear about this in Betrayal when we designed Betrayal. The characters talk, big bravado, like before you send them to be tortured by John, and then the next time you see them, they're horrified. They just say, please don't send me back. I'll do anything. Don't send me back to her tortures. What is going on in John's chambers? Like, I don't know what's going on in there. 
Like, why are we working with this person? But at the same time, it's the question, are the syndicate villains? They seem to be building, transporting, and researching to bring civilization to Ray class. They're just going about it in a heavy-handed, sort of dominating sort of way. And the thing is, like, this whole story was kicked off by the murder of Jun's order. And we're not even sure exactly how that happened. We just hear that it did happen. We know that Giannis Parandis betrayed the order, and that ended up with all of them killed. But was Katarina responsible for that, or was Janice responsible for that? Because we meet Janice Parandis, and he's a very self-serving, vile, like, hates himself, feels very, like, inadequate kind of vibe, because he has the Parandis family name, but he doesn't have any of their wealth. And also, the order, as seen in the flavor text of Scarabs, was crucial to humanity's stability throughout Ray class history. They played pivotal roles in the background this entire time. What happens now that they're gone? You know, who's the bad guy here? Like, we're working with a torturer and a murderer to fight against other torturers and murderers, maybe? And that brings us to, like, the syndicate members, which I had an absolute blast when I was first hired. This is one of the first things I worked on. Our NPC philosophy is most evinced in this series of, like, 20 different characters. We've got Elrion, for example, a man of integrity compelled to participate. But did Templar life make him susceptible to hierarchy? If you like, listen to some of his comments when you run into him, he just takes orders. But he also apologizes for attacking you. Uh, then we've got Chimeria, a, soci a sociopath given opportunity to do awful things. So, outright evil, right? Oh, except there's a subplot where he's learning from General Gravisius how to behave. It's really strange. Like, there's no 100% complete take on any of these. Of course, we've got Janus, uh, or Janus somehow, I don't know how to pronounce that, but fun person attempting to do selfish things. He's inept, but his actions have led to horrible consequences to the point where Jun's only take on Janus is, I will kill you. I, I hate you. She literally just says, I hate you. And finally, we've got inexplicable beings from alien moralities like It That Fled, impossible to analyze, conflicting interactions. Sometimes, for example, It That Fled says, please don't send me back to the dark place. Sometimes It That Fled says, yes, send me to the dark place. What's going on with It That Fled? We'll never know because we can't understand it. Finally, the player's role in all this, we're a wrench in the works of a living world. Player characters don't have a major backstory because they're you. We never tell players how to feel. All that you are is someone interacting with the living world in the way that you want to interact. If you wanted to interact with betrayal and never let anyone get punished and just let them all go, you can actually do that. And you don't even have to do the story of the acts if you don't want to. You'll never progress because we didn't make content where you just sit around and do nothing, but it's possible. This brings us to our time philosophy, actually. When it comes to things like acts, leagues, end game maps, it's really crucial to understand what we're doing here. There's actually separate timelines. If anyone recognizes this, it's from Steins Gate World Lines, different timelines uh, visualized here. Each league starts on day zero, the same day on Rayclass. An exile has washed up on shore. We can't acknowledge previous league storylines directly because they didn't happen in this timeline. But the campaign story can affect the league story. For example, Cassia mentions the fall of innocence because it's very important to her character. So the campaign can affect the league, but not the other way around. And that also brings us to the fact that we can't create a situation where a character must go backwards. Just like in real life, we have to avoid accidental time travel. We can't have players going back to like lower level areas because it, like, that means like if a quest is gated on something that you did in an earlier area and you didn't do that thing, that's a huge problem because this is just a huge waste of everybody's time. And finally, we don't address game necessities such as repeatable content and waypoints, except for the one time that Tarkley actually mentions a waypoint, but you know, oops. And to explain leagues versus maps, this is a 3.9 is actually going to be a great example of timeline type conflicts. So, question like, when did Blight League happen? Now that Blight League is going to be over for 3.9, well, never on the character timeline. So, Blight League is in another timeline entirely. When did Xana's storyline occur? Now that we're going to see a new map endgame, well, her storyline occurred in the past on the player timeline because you guys remember that. Now there's a new alternate version in the past on the character timeline as well, where other exiles helped her. And then we've got, uh, for Metamorph League, Tane. When is his story happening? Well, now on the character timeline. But when is the new Atlas story happening? Now on the player timeline, because it's new to you. Even though it's part of the world, it really wasn't in real time. So it's now on the player timeline that the new map system is happening. And to like... Describe the character timeline a, bit, a little bit. Events that happen inside the game to the character, that's the character timeline. 
The character is the one who ran through the acts, did the leagues and the maps in that particular character's life. If you start a new character, they have a different character timeline. But the players, players are higher dimensional entities. Players remember across all our carefully constructed stories, their experience is different than the way the game proceeds. For this reason, we must honor what came before. Uh, we absolutely considered, uh, what happens now that the Shaper and the Elder are dead? Well, we can't simply retcon Xana and the Shaper storyline out of existence because players lived that, they identified with it, they loved the way that story ended or how it progressed. So that happened. It has to integrate, it has to be honored, it has to be kept in, and we have to build on that. So, uh, and new events and leagues must also fit with previous events and leagues, even if they never interact, because you guys remember across all the timelines. So we can't have things that conflict because that would bother the lore scholars. And then finally, there's actually a third timeline going on, the historical timeline. This doesn't change very often. This, the world of Ray Class exists outside of the character and player timelines. Every glyph or tidbit a player finds is a piece of that puzzle. Again, these are subjective viewpoints only. These are glyphs like left by Victorio, that kind of thing. They happened hundreds of years ago. Every single character is going to see these, and they're always the same because they happened so long ago that we don't have to mess with when they happen. And now finally, the actually attempt to implement it, how do we actually do this is its own beast entirely. How does Grinding Gear Games actually go about this process? Well, it depends heavily on art. Art has many pipelines. Writing, that's like me, I'm involved with the process sometimes. Other times, great art just appears. I mean, say, how do we explain this in the story? And so there's a back and forth with art. For example, like, when I work with art early, we can make a unified story, but when they come up with an incredible art, the story has to change around it to encompass it. And ultimately what happens is this composite thing that's absolutely wonderful that no one person fully had control over but turns out into its own like evolving organic story and world, which I actually really like. We've got many in-house artists and freelancers, but the art director, Eric Olof, is an absolutely key because a creative director because it all goes through him. And if he wasn't there, like it would just become a mess, but it all has to unify in one point and that's what he, that's what he serves as. And for me, my writing, so design has a mechanical framework. They come, to my, they come to me, or maybe they come to Nick, depending on what type of content it is. And often Jonathan and Eric, and sometimes Mark too, are involved at a higher level, you know, sort of setting out what we need to do with these stories. But we basically just set up a document, and we go back and forth for weeks. We write dozens of iterations of every single story, and I personally lore check every single thing to make sure that it fits, and if it doesn't fit, they're like, oh, that doesn't fit into stuff we've previously established. And there is no retconning. I'm not, I'm not going to be doing that. Like, I'm going to make this stuff fit because that's the thing I enjoy most. <laughs> now, an example of a sheet like this, for Betrayal, we had a massive spreadsheet document for 20 different characters that had over 2,000 lines of dialogue, which we, we were guessing players have only heard half of because every single of one of these 20 different characters had stuff to say about every single one of the other characters. It wasn't always unique, but it did depend on a series of interactions they've had. So like if you torture one, the next time you see them, they're complaining because you know, we specifically made the, them to feel real. And that took absolutely forever and was a blast. And then we went, you know, once we, Nick and I went over all of those and wrote our individual characters, then of course the bosses, like Eric went over that. And then we did that 10 more times until we got it right. And uh, another part of my job here is to make the game mechanics at the base of the story feel natural. So for example, like the, the video of 3.9, uh, I believe, yeah, showed a, something you can socket in the atlas, and it's, it was told to us as an atlas socketable quest reward, tier three. Uh, I'm like, I'm gonna call that a watchstone, and I think the players will understand that a lot better. You know, we have to come up with reasons why these game, game mechanics fit into the world. So, so that means some very specific mechanisms that seem arbitrary are actually design constraints to prevent exploits, and we just gotta work with it. And recording, one of the most fun things here. So it's a question of how do characters we love get created? Like we have scripts and we have auditions and we have in-studio recordings that the writers actually go to and help guide these characters. But the key is to hire somebody for the voice actor who can infuse their own ideas and take the character. For example, uh, Einhar is Einhar and no one else could ever do Einhar. And we absolutely love him. We just let him do what he's gonna do. Uh, and that is how like the, the characters that we love get created is just, not being afraid to let these voice actors take these lines we've written to life, not being overbearing on that. 
And finally, cohesion really comes down to the fact that basically everything you see in game all has a motive and a world behind it that we've worked on. Nothing is random. And we often layer in ideas multiple leagues ahead of time to foreshadow events. Like I'll leave something in a flavor text or, you know, there's questions like, I love, for example, like Riker Maloney from uh, The Syndicate. He's very mysterious. Nobody knows who he is, but eventually one day maybe we'll find out. And when that happens, people are like, oh my God, I saw this coming. No, you didn't, <laughs> but it'll be fun. So like, what can we expect from 4.0 with the stuff I've just described? Well, each act has its own story, but there is a unified story across all acts. So each act is sort of like a bottle. Like you complete the story of the characters or the NPCs that you meet. Uh, whatever their end final fate is, it's done for that act, but the entire 4.0 has a unified story for you that you'll be following. And we'll off, we get to see a lot of cultures we didn't get to see in the first story. Uh, for example, Act 1 is the Ezemites. And people asked for Ezemites, and I said, let's start with the one people are asking for. And so we did. And you're going to see a lot of changes with those NPCs within an act rather than a two-part structure, because the current game has that two-part structure with, you know, you revisit areas. Here we're going to try to do that where, like, new music is available because you got a loot for Una, you know, from where she dropped it and stuff like that. Or you better their situation by letting them go and find food so then they're not hungry anymore and they're happier. And they get happier the more that you do, or if you ruin their lives, they're going to hate you and spit on you like Groost. And of course, there's the time skip versus the first story of 20 years later. But we'll also have uh, new classes and new personalities. There's going to be a blast to write. We've done some of this. For example, Karui culture is reacting to their gods being proven real and then also destroyed. Uh, so all of that stuff from the first game of like, like Marauder quoting like Tukahama and Kitava and Hainakura. Well, yeah, the gods are real, but they also got killed like real fast as soon as we found out that they were real. So what did the Kurui culture like do in response to that? The Templar culture is having a similar dilemma, except Innocence wasn't destroyed. Innocence is still around, but he chose to go into exile instead of taking care of his followers. So, wow, centuries of overbearing faith on an Oriath, and your God just chose to peace out to the, you know, the, the southern reaches of the world. How is the Templar reacting to that? These ca the character classes are going to be very interesting to write and to see their culture they come from. And finally, there's a power level reset. At the end of the first story, we were fighting gods and extra-dimensional avatars of fundamental forces. You know, we're regrounding that story to a human level again. You know, we're finding food, we're protecting the weak, we're killing zombies because we're not that same exile from 20 years ago. You know, that person is now a myth for this world. So in summary, that's, uh, consider your audience, you know, build a narrative structure and then try to actually implement it. And that's how we do things at Grinding Your Games for the story. And I think that we can go to some Q&A now. That was an awesome talk, man. Oh, thank you. And really cool to see all the different axes that you use and all the different ways you think about everything. We've got a, a lot of questions here. We don't even need to fill any kind of time. These guys are rabid oh. to hear your opinions. So let's uh, kick it off. We've got a nice one here. Uh, are there any plans for an official lore compilation or the retelling of in-game lore out of game? I love the lore, but I don't love disrupting my gameplay to read or listen to it all the time. You know, I think I just had that question last night at Wildfire as well with uh, players. Uh, I would love to do that, and uh, am I allowed to say just pressure Chris Wilson to make that happen? <laughs> I mean, you can certainly try. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would absolutely love to write that for you guys, because we, we do have all that lore hidden at the company. We just, you know, the game only allows a certain layer of that to be revealed. Kind of on the same vein, uh, have you ever thought about doing any kind of other comics or other media to fill in more lore as well? So there is a book coming, and it's sort of described as a choose-your-own-adventure, but that's not the phrase we're supposed to use. It's only like a game book through the Path of Exile world where you play through the labyrinth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I've read that, and it's f awesome. I'm very happy and excited for that. That's really wicked to hear. It's definitely yeah. going to be a popular purchase, I think, for a lot of Exiles. Um, has there ever been any examples of lore that was added to amend or mistake a plot hole that you know of? So the only thing I can think of here is that, like, Hillock's story, for example, changed a bunch of times. Um, we haven't really had stuff to retcon earlier things or explain earlier things, because if something is left conflicting in terms of subjective viewpoint, that's OK. But a Hillock's story definitely changed repeatedly until we finally found a place for him in the syndicate as everyone's, like, lovable, has no idea what's going on, bash you into red milk, you know? Yeah, definitely. He certainly fills that role very well. Uh, Ooh, there we go. Uh, how much does the target audience influence the story versus you sticking true to your own vision? Have there been any examples that you've had where community feedback has made you change your mind about the way you want to write something? Hmm. Absol absolutely. So 
Our personal vision is less about, so Nick and I write this stuff, we talk all the time, we check each other, so is that because you wanna write that or is that because like, it's be interesting in the community? And so we make sure that our personal vision is more in service to what the players wanna see because if everyone here said that they wanted to see it that flight in every league, I'd try to make that happen because you know, it's, it's what you guys wanna play as opposed to you know, a particular vision that we want to force on the game. Like the, the game is its own living force at this point. You know, art is putting things in that become part of the world. And, you know, uh, design is putting things in that become part of the world. So it, would, it wouldn't really work if we just tried to force a story on everyone. Awesome. It's really cool to hear you guys like, constantly consider that kind of stuff. And I'm yeah, sure absolutely. the community will be very pleased to hear that. Uh, what's your favorite part of the old POE campaign? And uh, why is it your favorite? Oh, I absolutely love the run-up to Piety and Dominus, especially in Act 3. Because uh, that actually, I'm probably biased because when I first started playing Path, that was the end of the game. I would just run Piety over and over and for like forever it felt like I was dreaming about like, who is Dominus? We're going to meet this guy and he's going to be a huge figure in the story. And he like dies as soon as we meet him. But, you know, it's still really cool. Like the Scepter of God is just amazing. I love it. Awesome. Uh, will we ever meet the uh, first ones that Einhard keeps talking about and will they perhaps be Lovecraftian inspired? So I believe that there were avatars of the first one in Beastary League. You can open these portals and they were very rare and hard to meet. And I'm not entirely convinced from a writing standpoint that those were the first ones. But uh, the hooded one, the entity that you meet with some advice for you in Act 104.0 actually has something to say about the first ones. Uh, after you meet Einhar. Uh, kind of following onto that with the hooded one, I know that uh, someone has asked about whether we're looking into sort of a narrator-like character similar to Dickhead Kane for... Uh Path of Exile 2. Is that a role that you can see the Hooded One filling, or perhaps another character? Ooh, this is a tough question without giving away spoilers, but I would say that the Hooded One has aspects of Deckard Cain's character in terms of wisdom, but don't count them out as just a sideline, you know, stand bystander? Yeah. That's a very tactful answer. <laughs> Can't uh, give away spoilers. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the synthesis storytelling hit the right spot uh, for even the speedsters. How likely is it to have more content where you have a lot of vocalized lore that you can listen to as you continue the fight? Mm. What was the first part of that again? Uh, the synthesis uh, storytelling really hit the spot for a lot of the faster players and races because they could fight and, and listen at the same time. So we are absolutely moving towards uh, reaching speedsters and people moving fast. So everything that we do, we're trying to move more towards a direction of what we call green text, where like if you have output dialogue to chat, it shows up at the bottom, and it's playing as you continue to move. So all of the lore objects, for example, in 4.0, you no longer have to stand in place. What they do is they read out what they have to say as you move. And one of the ones I like the best, uh, there's a burning village at the end of the demo. There's a letter posted like a, a traitor was like stabbed and burned at the stake. You can read that letter at the beginning and run through the burning village and fight this whole, whole way through while listening to that letter. So we're, allowed, we're able to do longer things and more intricate things because we're letting you run along and do your game while you do it. That's super awesome. I'm going to have yeah. to find that letter. Uh, Path of Exile's original writer, uh, Edwin, had an issue with the game story taking on too much of a heroic save-the-world narrative. Will PoE 2's story return to a more intimate anti-hero experience? I'm glad you asked because I can say I'm a huge fan of keeping it grounded personally. And I can't promise that, because obviously I'm not in complete control of the story, but we have reset it on purpose. We kept the power level low, and we're not gonna rush to incredible heights because you know the gods came out of nowhere in the last one. All of a sudden, you have five acts about saving the world, fighting gods. If there's anything like that, there's gonna be a very long buildup, and it will probably be the climax of the entire story as opposed to like the thing you do mostly throughout the acts. Uh, and some of the old dialogue, the witch mentioned something called the twist. Uh, I'm not sure if it's in the game anymore, but what was the twist referring to, if you know? The twist was definitely uh, another word for like, the cataclysm and the effect of corruption. And it was referring to the actual moment where like, the world tilted, like when the insanity took over for briefly and killed basically all of Rayclast. Cool. Uh, when Zana's voice actress was changed, her lines were reworked and almost every new line ended with exile. Uh, later, many of these were chopped off at the end. Do you have any other fun tales of dialogue surgery that we've done in the game? Ooh, so I think we definitely wanted to add more to Cassia, but we didn't really get around to it because her songs were a big hit initially and then drove people insane a couple weeks later. But there just really wasn't time to get to that, unfortunately. But we're definitely always trying to keep that in mind. Awesome. Uh, we're starting to run a little short on time, but to finish us off, uh, 
you're obviously a, a Dark Universe writer, mm -hmm. self-titled. Uh, what other kind of stories and media have inspired uh, your writing and the way that you write the world of Path of Exile? H.P. Lovecraft, first out. So like they actually, uh, Grinding Gear brought me over from the States because before this I was uh, a Lovecraftian Dark Universe horror writer already by career, you know, the last decade or so. And when they, I saw the job posting for this and it basically described me exactly, I'm like, did you guys write this about me? Because uh, Absolutely Lovecraftian, absolutely like, um, if you've like, stuff, seen stuff like the movie like In the Mouth of Madness where it's all about uh, insanity, doubting yourself, doubting the world, like horrible creatures, horrible mutations half seen in the dark, all that kind of stuff is absolutely fantastic. I love piecing together what kind of cosmic nightmare we're in because just like Venarius thought, we are surrounded by demons and we're going to find that out. Definitely. Well, that's about all we have time for. Sorry, guys, but uh, sit tight for the next 10 minutes or so and surely we'll have the game design deep dive with uh, some of the key players in uh, the development of the game. Hope you have a great conference. Thanks.